In case you don't speak Tolkienese, I'm going to explain that movie clip to you. I've seen it many times, but I'll be honest. I, I fact check myself by calling my son, who I think has most of the entire book books memorized. The movie clip connection to this morning's scripture passage will become very obvious later on. In Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, J.R.R. Tolkien, by the way, he is the guy that influenced C.S. Lewis the most to become a Christian. In his Lord of the Rings, Gandalf, the white wizard, is somewhat of a Messiah figure representing good as opposed to some of the other characters in the story who represent evil. The king that Gandalf is exercising to some demonic force out of is named Theoden. He's the guy with the ashen face, the old man sitting on the throne. He's king of a kingdom called Rohan. He has become totally enslaved, key word for this morning, and controlled by an evil enemy called Saruman. Saruman's voice is the one speaking to Gandalf through Theoden. He's the person that goes flying across the floor when Gandalf finally cast him out of Theoden. The awful looking creature that is acting as an advisor to the king is another slave or minion of evil, of the evil Saruman. His name is called Grimma Wormtongue. He has been promised the beautiful Eowyn, the bond that appears midway through the clip, if he will control Theoden, or help Saruman control Theoden, and help him take over Rohan. Now that's a lot, but here's the bottom line. Gandalf is there to set Theoden free from bondage to the evil forces that have enslaved him. You might also be asking, how did Theoden allow himself to become enslaved at this level to evil? Short answer. By associating himself to begin with, with Wormtongue. And by allowing Wormtongue to have access to him over a long period of time, to poison his mind and his spirit, believing all the while that Wormtongue meant good for him, he, he, he's supposed to be providing remedies to help him with some of the suffering, physical suffering he's going through. Theoden believed and embraced Wormtongue's lies eventually, and his continual association with and relationship with Wormtongue and his lies eventually enslaved Theoden. Quick application, I'm sure you get it, even before we get to the scripture text. Who we hang out with greatly impacts our lives. The things we look at continuously, the people or the podcast or the media that we listen to and observe will very simply either bless you or curse you. It's as simple as that. Turn with me now to John chapter 8 beginning in verse 30, and I'm going to pick up where Lee left off last week, and we'll continue our journey through the book of John. If you'll recall, we left off with Jesus in the temple courts, speaking to a group, a mixed group of Jews that had in it people that were beginning to believe in him at some level. There were different levels of belief in the crowd, and a whole bunch of his enemies some of the Jewish leadership who were actually already beginning to plot to kill him. And he's been going back and forth with these Jewish leaders throughout his teaching time this week. Jesus, uh, excuse me, Lee just shared last week about Jesus standing up and, and kind of in the middle or toward the end of the Feast of Tabernacles. He went through that whole ritual of all they'd done that week and declaring himself to be the light of the world and actually calling himself the great I am, which by the way, if you're not God, that's heresy. And those Jews knew it. But people are starting to believe him because of the miracles and the power of his teaching. So verse 30, even as he spoke, many believed in him. That's incredibly encouraging. To the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said this, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples. What he's saying is, if you begin to apply what I've taught you to your lives and walk in obedience to these teachings, you really are my disciples. The proof is in the pudding, so to speak. 
Then you will know the truth. Now, when he uses that word truth, he's using it in two senses. He's referring to himself, if you know me, and he's also referring to truths, the many truths he's sharing with them. If you know these truths, if you know me as truth, the truth will set you free, he will set you free, and his teachings will set you free. I want to point this out right now. There's a symbiotic relationship between hearing and obeying and getting more revelation. Act on what you know to be true, what you understand, and God will show you more and more and more. That's one of the things he's communicating. Let me say this too before we continue with the passage. The word free or freedom is gonna be used four times in the passage. It's an incredibly important word in this story. Truth is going to be used seven times. That's incredibly important. Sin is going to be referred to two times. Slave is going to be referred to three times. Slave or slavery. Father is going to be referred to nine times. And Abraham will be referred to six times. Those are some of the key concepts and words in this passage of Scripture. Verse 33, they answered him. Who's they? Probably this is some of the Jewish leadership. Obviously, hundreds or maybe even thousands of people didn't rise up in unison and say this. Somebody said this, and some other people started chiming in. We are Abraham's descendants, the Jewish leaders start to say. And the debate starts again. And have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say we shall be free? Now, I don't think they're as naive as to be saying We've never been enslaved as a people group to another people group because, duh, there's that Egyptian thing, you know, several hundred years. There's the Babylonian captivity, the Greeks, the Seleucids, the Romans. Uh, I mean, they've been enslaved lots of times. They're in kind of bondage right now to the Roman. They're dominated by them. So they understand, I believe at this point, that Jesus is talking about spiritual freedom. They're going to go back and forth in this dialogue between the physical realm and the spiritual realm. And so Jesus replies, very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. This is the key concept of this passage this morning, is slavery to sin or freedom from sin. So he's kind of flipping the script a little bit. He's saying, I'm not saying that you are spiritually bound to the Romans. I'm not saying that. He's saying, I'm saying to you exactly, to these Jewish leaders, you're slaves to sin. He's gonna say it clearly. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family. What family is he talking about? The family of God. But a son belongs to it forever. So if the son, now he refers to himself as the son, the Messiah, the son of God, sets you free, if I set you free, You'll be free indeed. Free from what though? Not bondage to the Romans or the Egyptians or the Babylonians. Bondage to sin. That's what this is all about. This discussion is all about. He says, now they're going to say, we're Abraham's descendants. They've already said that. So he says, duh, I know you're Abraham's descendants. I'm not stupid. I know you're a Jew and then I'm a Jew. Yet you're looking for a way to kill me. Now he's going to indict them for a very specific sin. They're conspiring to kill him. Indicating they're slaves to their own jealousy, their own anger, their own pride. They're mad at him and they want to kill him. Because you have no room for my word. You won't receive the truth I've been preaching. I'm telling you what I've seen in the Father's very presence. He says here... Later on, I come directly from God. I came from his presence. And you're doing what you heard from your father. Who's their father? Well, there's going to be a big discussion about that. He's telling them he believes their father is who? The devil. That's a very serious charge. Abraham is our father, they answer. Now they go back to the physical realm. And they want to talk on that flame. He's there. He said, I know that. By the way, John the Baptist in Luke 3, 8, when these same Jewish leaders came out to see him and have dialogue with him, before they even had a chance to talk, John said this to him, Luke 3, 8. He said, don't tell me you're Abraham's descendants. Don't hang 
your spirituality on Abraham and you think you can derive some spiritual rightness before God based on your lineage or your DNA or your, your ethnicity. It won't work. He said, God can make descendants of Abraham out of these stones or rocks. So this is the second time a prophet from God has spoken this to them in the last probably 18 months. And Jesus is saying the same thing. If you were Abraham's children, he goes, okay, let's talk about Abraham for a minute. If you really were Abraham's spiritual descendants, then you would do what Abraham did. In other words, when truth is revealed to you, like Abraham did, he left his land where he lived and obeyed God and traveled. When it was spoken to him that he would have a child of promise, he believed. Hebrews chapter 11, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Abraham was a bigger mess than the rest of us. If you know the story, he did some pretty stupid things. But when God showed him something, he acted in faith on it. And now God himself is walking these Palestine hills, feeding thousands, walking on water, raising the dead, healing thousands of sick people, creating food out of nothing, teaching powerful teachings, and they still won't believe. If you were Abraham's children, you'd do what Abraham did. As it is, you're looking for a way to kill me, back to their sin, and being a slave to sin. A man who has told you the truth, I heard from God. Abraham didn't do stuff like that. He didn't do such things. You're doing the works of your own father, second time he said it. We are not illegitimate children. That's a cheap shot. They're saying, you don't even know who your daddy is. They've heard the rumors. I mean, would you have believed that a teenage girl conceived immaculately? That's a hard pill to swallow. They're taunting him, saying, Joseph's not your real father. Who is your father? You don't even know who your daddy is. We're not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. Now they're really getting desperate. They're saying, God's our father. How ironic. God is Jesus' father. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I've come directly from him. I've not even to come on my own accord. God sent me here. By the way, the word, one of the definitions of the word Messiah is a sent one. He was sent by God. Why is my language not clear to you? He answers his own question, because you're not able to hear what I say. You belong to your father, all right? Your father, the devil. And you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. What does he mean by that? He's going to call him a liar in the next sentence. And when he told that lie to Eve and she bought it, all of Eve's unborn children, that's you and I, including Eve and Adam, and when Adam bought it, when the two of them bought the lie of the snake, all of us were subject all of a sudden to the law of sin and death. And millions and billions of people died because of Satan's deception of Eve and then Adam. It's as simple as that. You want a specific example back in Genesis? Of course, there's the Cain and Abel thing. But it's bigger than that. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. The truth is a big deal with Jesus. It is with God. For there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language. For he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell the truth, as opposed to the lies he speaks that you're believing and you're acting as one of his minions right now, trying to kill me, you don't believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I'm telling the truth, why don't you believe me? He answers the question again. Whoever belongs to God, Here's what God says. The reason you don't hear, you don't belong to God. A pretty powerful indictment by Jesus. What's in that for us, though? We've talked for weeks already about this ongoing debate between the Pharisees and the Jewish religious and Jesus, and we're going to continue. But I want to pause that discussion and put out this concept of slavery to sin and how to be free from sin this morning. And that's what we're going to talk about the rest of the morning. Jesus clearly states here in, and in lots of other places that we humans, not just as those first century Jewish leaders, we have a sin issue. 
And then we need to be set free from slavery to sin. And we don't like that terminology. And he even identifies in this passage the primary source of sin as coming from a spirit being called the devil. That we know from other passages of scripture, if you want to check it out later, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, is really a rebellious angel who is at war with God and is the source of all evil. We also know that because our ancient ancestors joined, that's Adam and Eve, with Satan and his angelic allies in this rebellion, his angelic allies are demons, that we inherited as a result of their poor choices and were born with a predisposition to sin. C.S. Lewis calls it a bent to sin. The Bible calls it our sin nature. We also know that the culture of this world, hear me on this, in its various expressions, referred to in the Bible as this world system, is controlled and manipulated by those evil spiritual forces, Satan and his demons. We don't like to think about that, especially in Western Christianity. Jesus referred to Satan in other places as the ruler of this world. He said he came to depose him by his sacrificial death. In summary, we know that this world system, the spiritual forces of evil, and our own sin nature work together to try to keep us enslaved to sin patterns in our lives during our brief time on this planet. Summary again, our three enemies. If you're a Jesus follower this morning, here are your enemies according to scripture. Your own sin nature, number one. Psalm 51, five, David said it. Romans 7, 18, Paul said it. Number two, the devil and his demons. They're our enemies. Ephesians 6, 11 through 12, the classic passage on spiritual warfare. James said it in James 4, 7. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9, Peter said it. And then there's this world system, Romans 12, 1 and 2. You know that passage of scripture. Paul says, Jim, don't be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world. Don't let this world squeeze you into its mold. Don't let the evil forces that created these cultures around you squeeze you into the culture's mold. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. John also says it. I'll let you look that one up. Let's talk about sin a minute. What is sin? There's a lot of definitions of sin. I'm going to give you two this morning, a real short one and a real long one. The real short one that we're most familiar with is this, and it's a good one. Sin is rebellion against God and his ways or his value system. Rebellion against God and his ways. Here's a comprehensive definition of sin. I love this. Ran into it a couple of weeks ago. It's by John Piper. Sin is the glory of God not honored. The holiness of God not reverenced. The greatness of God not admired or praised. The power of God not praised. The truth of God, we're talking about that this morning, not sought. The wisdom of God not esteemed or valued. The beauty of God not treasured. The goodness of God not savored. The faithfulness of God not trusted. The promises of God not really believed. The commandments of God not obeyed. The justice of God not respected. And certainly in our culture today, the wrath or the judgment of God not feared. The grace of God not cherished. The presence of God not prized. And the person of God not loved. And I would add, resulting in, going back to that shorter definition, behavior and a lifestyle that does not embrace God's value system. When Jesus says he came to set us free from slavery to sin, he's talking in broad terms about freeing us from three aspects of sin. Let me share that with you this morning. The first one is the penalty of sin. That's our fear of death. He came to free us from that. The Bible talks about two deaths. There's physical death. And like we always say around here, the death, that death rate is still hovering right around 100%. You're going to die. Let me be an agent of reality for you this morning. The second death, though, he came to free us from and fear of is eternal separation by God. 
Together, all that together is called the law of sin and death. He came to free us from that. And primarily what Jesus is talking about in this passage, though, this morning, is not that. It's number two. The power of sin in this life, in the here and now. That's the emphasis of today's text. Jesus wants to tear down sin patterns in your life and mine. It's as simple as that. Sometimes he does that dramatically and powerfully and immediately. But most of the time, that's a process that he invites us into and wants us and requires us to participate in with his Holy Spirit. He could zap us, but in my life experience, unfortunately, he usually doesn't. And thirdly, he came to free us from the presence of sin after our death when we're with him forever. The goal for this life is for us to walk in freedom from slavery to sin and become, as the scripture tells us, a slave to righteousness in his ways and his value system. Here's a verse on that point. Romans 6, 17 through 18, Paul says this, but thanks be to God, though you used to be slaves to sin, Jim, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed and is claiming your allegiance. That ought to be true of you. You have been set free from sin and sin patterns in your life. And you become a slave to what? Righteousness. i tell you how you know it's a good day in church. If you start with a Lord of the Rings clip and you get a Bob Dylan quote halfway through, okay? <laughs> so here's Bob Dylan on this point. You got to serve somebody. He wrote a song about it. In fact, here's a line from the song. It's very simple and straightforward. It might be the devil, it might be the Lord, but you're going to serve somebody. Right. Our part. We have a part to play in being set free, as I already said, in this life from the power of sin. Here are a few suggestions from Scripture for you, things we're called to do. Number one, try to live in obedience to Jesus' teachings. The Bible says in, I believe, 10 places by four different authors, Make every effort. That's a requirement of you and I, not the Holy Spirit. That's our part. We're supposed to make every effort to live in obedience to Jesus' teachings, John 8, 31. Number two, know the word and renew your mind. I've already quoted Romans 12, 1 and 2. Renew your mind daily by immersing yourself in this book. Number three, stand firm when the attacks come and put on the full armor of God, Ephesians 6, beginning in verse 11. Then James simply said, James always brief, short, and to the point, just resist the devil. Number five, confess your sins to one another. That's not popular in evangelical culture, James 5, 16. Let's talk about truth for a minute. It's used seven times in the passage. Jesus says it is the truth that sets people free. Jesus is using the term truth in two ways here. They're really tied together. I've already said this, I'll say it again. Number one, he is the truth and his spirit is truth. John 14, six, a verse that expounds on the exclusivity of the gospel. Jesus says this on the last night of his life to his boys. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, 16 through 17, later that evening, I will ask the Father, and he's going to give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you, and he will be in you, and you have access to that Holy Spirit if you really belong to Jesus. Secondly, truth means his teachings. The Bible is the word of truth, John 17, 17, 2 Timothy 2, 15. Now, our Western culture today tends to reject this notion of absolute truth. The culture has unfortunately greatly affected many Christians, or at least people that claim to be Christians, views on absolute truth. In a recent poll of people identifying as Christians in America, it showed that 85% believe that Jesus Christ is not the only way to God or heaven. 
That's a scary statistic. Even though Jesus clearly states he is the truth and the only way to God. I'm going to share with you a modern day story from a friend of mine about this whole idea of slavery to sin and being freed from it. Before I do, let me set it up. Let's go back to that scene from the Lord of the Rings. And I know what some of you are thinking and it makes you feel good and me too. Jim, I'm not enslaved to evil at that level. I'm not and here's the Western term for it in Western Christian, possessed. Let me, let me shock some of you. There is no Greek term used in the New Testament the way we use the term possessed. The Greek words refer to the influence of demonic entanglement in a person's life as just simply demonized and literally refer to all levels of influence of demons on a person in any degree. Now, obviously, some people are almost controlled, and we could use the word possessed, by demonic forces or enslaved to it greater than other people. But I want to look at an interesting example from Scripture that ought to bother you a little bit because it bothers me. Matthew 16, 21 through 23. From that time on, Matthew says, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hand of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed on the third day and raised to life. He's just sharing with, he's being an agent of reality. Here's what's coming, guys. Peter, in his arrogance, and acting as a channel for the evil one, says this to Jesus. He rebukes Jesus. Never, Jesus, never, Lord. This shall never happen to you. And Jesus turns to Peter and recognizes who's speaking to Peter. Get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You don't have in mind right now the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. You like it that you can walk around with somebody that's powerful, that's on top of the world. By the way, it's, it's the same temptation that Jesus was tempted with in the desert, a shortcut to glory that did not involve a cross. And remember what was said at that time? The devil would come back at an opportune time. Well, he's back and he's speaking through Peter. All of us are influenced at times by evil spiritual forces to sin. And those forces want to make habits or sin patterns out of such things as, let me be specific, unforgiveness. That's a biggie with God. Anger, jealousy, rebellion, love of stuff, the American sin, drugs, alcohol, pornography, et cetera, et cetera. To enslave you and I to those sin patterns. Now, none of us wants to believe that those sin patterns dominate or control us. But that's exactly what Jesus is warning against in this passage. He's accusing the Jewish leaders of being slaves to their sins of pride, jealousy, deceit, and anger. And he tells them they're being manipulated by the devil to conspire to kill him. So what does that look like today in our life or in our culture? I asked permission for a friend to share a story. It's a pretty dramatic story. A few of you have heard, a few of you know who this is. Uh, he's going to tell us about a sin pattern that was in his life, how he got there, how enslaved he was, how he was delivered, and what he does to maintain his freedom today. If you pull up that picture of Ken and Tanya Shackelford and their family, Ken is currently serving as a pastor. That's just some of his children. He's adopted lots of kids. He's got some that were born to he and Tanya, and some of them are not in the picture. But he's serving as a pastor right now at an international church in Tunisia, in the Middle East. He and his family are about to move to Italy. He's going to pastor a church there. Ken was the first full-time minister of this church. He and I served together here for several years. He's a close friend, and this is his story. I was first exposed to pornography at age 13. I got a summer job, and me and another teenage boy traveled to a farm outside of town, and he had magazines. I was exposed a lot more in high school through my traveling soccer team. I convinced myself it wasn't an issue through college and into marriage simply because it wasn't readily available to me, and I didn't risk going to buy those magazines. Then the internet came out. 
and kick my tail. I was very tech savvy and ahead of the curve. I knew how to access it and hide my tracks. I did it very well. I was a Christian and a full-time youth minister serving on church staffs this entire time. Absolutely no one, not even my wife, had a clue about my struggles. I didn't grow up in a church tradition that encouraged accountability or confession. In fact, I had never even heard a specific sin confession. The few confessions I'd heard were what I call safety confessions, stuff like, I'm really struggling right now with priorities in my life. Please pray for me. I felt like the lowest of low lives. I was quite sure no one was as hypocritical as I was. I fought it. I made foolish vows. I committed to overcome it on my own, just keeping it between me and God. Then for the first time in my life, though I'd grown up in a church and gone three times a week most of my life, I heard a guy speak about spiritual warfare. He specifically spoke about the target Satan put on ministers because he knows if he can take a minister down, he can drag many others with him. He put the fear of the Lord in me and also convinced me that the pathway to my freedom from this sin pattern was confession to those I was accountable to and prayers from them for my healing. By the way, that's scripture, James 5, 13 through 16. I committed after hearing that talk to confessing it to my wife, my elders, my parents, and my wife's parents specifically. It would have been better if I'd done it that way. I drove my car to an empty parking lot and I was so scared, I was shaking and weeping and crying out to God. I was about an hour and a half from my home and in that hour and a half drive home, the demons went into overtime to convince me, I didn't need to confess it to them, that I could just make a stronger commitment and overcome this sin on my own. Some of the lies in that hour and a half drive went like this. You'll get fired from your job and you won't be able to care for your family. Your wife will get so upset she'll have a miscarriage and blame you for the death of your first child. She was pregnant. You'll never get to minister again or be on a church staff and the calling God put on your life will be wasted. These lies helped me rationalize that I didn't need to confess, so I didn't. I just made a stronger commitment to quit. But of course, before long, I was falling again. God heard my heart cry, though, and prepared a way for me to confess. We ended up moving from Arkansas to a little wonderful church in California, full of loving people, but there was still no examples in my church of confession, and it was not a church that talked about spiritual warfare or the Holy Spirit. I'd been there for a few years, still struggling on and off, and God blessed my youth ministry in spite of my secret sin. If I had to pick one spot not to confess, it was the place God chose for me to do it. Should have listened the first time. The largest gathering of youth and their parents and church leaders in our church network on the West Coast at a weekend retreat. I felt an intense weight all weekend upon me to confess at the retreat. God made it clear when the time came, I had to specifically say the word pornography. Up to that point, I still had never heard anyone confess any sin specifically, let alone pornography. The last night of the retreat, I ended up having a live mic in my hand for various reasons with hundreds of people listening to me. And I started stuttering and stammering for so long that a group of concerned people, youth, parents, and leaders gathered around me by the time I finally said the word pornography. According to those around me, the moment I said that word, I dropped the microphone and collapsed and went into convulsions. An elder from another church who had grown up in a Pentecostal tradition recognized it as demonic activity. And he said verbally out loud, I command this demon of pornography to leave Ken right now. When he said that, the entire crowd on that mountaintop heard an unearthly shriek and a scream that came out of me and went up into the heavens and dissipated as it went. I remember hearing the scream, becoming so relaxed and so happy I couldn't stop smiling. I sat up and I felt like I could breathe deeply for the first time in years. Even though I knew I still had to confess to my wife, my church leaders, I heard God say, I got this, you just relax right now. It was an amazing experience of freedom. Revival broke out on that mountaintop, by the way, in California, and confession of sin went on for hours, some people all the way to daylight. 
Now, I know that most people's deliverance from sin strongholds and sin patterns is not that dramatic, but mine was. And I know that not everyone needs to confess their sin to 300 people at a youth retreat. The stories go on and on, he said in my life, though, about God's faithfulness. He just put the right people in our lives. After that, I got home and shared with my wife and some people that are still our closest friends, the love, the forgiveness, the prayer, and the support I received from my church, for everyone I confess to. But even though I experienced that powerful deliverance, I still, to this day, have to fight. Now, I've had to fight the last 25 years to maintain my freedom from slavery to sin. There have been some minor setbacks, not many. But there's still that constant pull, even though it's not as strong, to want to go back to Egypt, so to speak. The Christian life, Ken said, and the Bible says, is a discipline. And here's some of Ken's disciplines. Number one. I keep people in my life that I'm accountable to and I'm transparent and vulnerable with. Number two, I have consistent daily prayer and worship. Number three, I spend time in God's word every day. Number four, I fast regularly. Number five, I live in Christian community. Yeah, I attend church and small groups regularly. Number six, I embrace daily the love and the grace of God. Application for us. It's pretty simple. It's pretty indicting. What sin patterns do you need to be freed from? What are you willing to do to experience and walk in the freedom that Jesus promised that he died for you to walk in? Here's some resources at our church that can help you. Number one, discernment prayers through the Joshua Center or through New Heights. Call the church office or see a staff member for a referral. Number two, there's two classes going on right now, and I'm in one of them called Free Indeed. It's specifically geared toward doing exactly what I've just preached about for 45 minutes this morning. Number three, Celebrate Recovery. They're not available right now. They're full. They'll start again in August. Celebrate Recovery here on Sunday nights. Number four, Freedom in Christ. That's some steps that my wife and I have gone through numerous times and taken people food. Dennis Peterson does that. See him at the prayer room. There's some truth statements I gave you that were put in your bulletin. Use those. I pray those sometimes several times a week out loud. It's important to do that. And then it has already been stated by Don, understand the supernatural, an equipped class that's coming up. Right now, I want one person to come up here. David, head on up here. Who's been at New Heights for four months. And he's leaving to go back home this week. Uh, this is David Rathel. He's a pastor from Georgia, and he came here to get medical treatment at the Spiro Clinic. And I've asked him to share just for a few minutes kind of his journey in this regard. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you so much, Jim. You guys wave at me. Hello. <laughs> wave at me if you love Jesus. Right? Right? And uh, my name is David Rathel, and I am from Georgia. And did, did you guys, you guys might happen to know that it's the home of the greatest football team in the SSC. Well, we've heard that, yeah. You heard that yeah. before? I don't know if you have or not. We've heard of football here, but we forgot. <laughs> <out. laughs> well, um, about 14 years ago, I began to have a pain in my left foot. And it has grown, it grew to the point and harmed my family. It harmed my energy. It harmed my ability to function until uh, it got to such a place where last fall, I really couldn't hardly get out of bed, but maybe a couple of days a week. Um, I've been through a couple of surgeries, um, no good, until I, last spring a doctor, a new pain doctor in town in Columbus, Georgia, diagnosed me with something called uh, complex regional pain syndrome. And that brought me to a place I really hadn't heard of, Fayetteville, Arkansas. And I'm so glad it did. Um, and uh, there's a man here today I want to honor. His name is Bo Nall, and he's sitting right over here, and he had allowed me to stay in a camper at his house out in Prairie Grove. And he has fathered me and loved me and been part of my healing in Jesus' name. And so as I came, I'm, I was with some other patients at the clinic and we were just hanging out and talking. And I said, well, I'm going to church. I've been to a couple of churches. I'm going to go to church. And one of the patient's wife said, said, and we're talking to some people and there's another kind of pastor's wife there hanging out. And she said, and they said, well, we come to our church. And, and Stephanie said, said, well, do you have the good singers? <laughs> and so I knew I had a job to do. So I got on my phone that night and I said, it's okay, Stephanie, I got it. Eric and Stephanie, I got it. 
And I searched and I searched and I searched and I found the good singers. <laughs> and so, and we came that first Sunday, Eric, Stephanie, and I, we sat right there and Chad Holmes preached and I was not prepared for New Heights Church. I wasn't prepared. I've been to lots of churches. I've been serving Jesus since I was 15 years old. I've been to churches all over the world. It has been uh, 25 years since a church surprised me. Usually churches are very, very, very broad and wide, but not that deep. And, and other churches are very often very, very, very deep, but not that wide. But I don't know if any of you grew up in Sunday school like me. We used to sing a song called Deep and Wide, Deep and Wide. There's a fountain flowing deep and wide. And I walked in the door that day and the good singers were singing and the good preacher was preaching and by the way, I get a brand new favorite New Heights preacher every Sunday. <laughs> and I just think like, oh, that's my favorite. I hope he's preaching this week. Oh Lord, it's gonna be bad if he's not. Then the next week, I get another new favorite. And so when we came in that Sunday, it was like I got hit with a worship bat. It just almost knocked me out. And Chad preached and he preached that day about getting off your mat. And me and Eric were looking at each other like, oh, Lord Jesus. We cried and cried and cried and cried. And, and, and Chad preached like, get up, get up, get up. And if he would have said one more get up, I would have been up and running. And now I can walk around with my pain syndrome. The thing is so different with each patient, but it does kill me very often. But I've gotten so much help and freedom since being here. And your church has been a huge part of it. Your church has surprised me. You don't know what you have. You can't know. It's not possible for you to know because you're here all the time. This is the healthiest church I've ever seen. And we know that healthy things grow and growing things change. Change challenges us. Challenge forces us to trust God. Trust leads to obedience and obedience makes us healthy and healthy things grow. You have people here that have across a theological perspective that would cause 18 churches in, in another part of the city to split three times. <laughs> Isn't it true? Yeah. But you're held together by prayer, by love, by leadership. It's so powerful. Like it took me three weeks to be like, who's in charge around here? Who's in charge around here? It is Jesus. It Amen. is Jesus. Amen. And so one of the Sundays we came, this like prayer warrior kind of scout person in your discernment team named Heather. We were sitting right back here and Heather, like she's like search and destroy the demons, Heather. You know, I think that's her. I don't know. I think it's the name Heather. I don't yes, know. Yes, yeah. And so she comes up during the ministry time and says, come on, we're praying for you. And okay, I guess we're praying for us. Like, we're we're going to go outside to pray for you. And she grabs uh, April and a couple of other people and they look at her like, well, what, are we, what do you want us to do? We don't know these people. And others said, we're praying for them. And so they prayed for us and, and one of the people started just calling out things in my life that no one could know. And I've been waiting for this one because I've been wanting some discernment prayer for years, but some people you can't trust. And I felt like I could trust these people. And at the end of that prayer time we had out in the hallway, I wanted more. And I said, to, I said to April, I said, do you guys pray for people like do you other times? Because I know about this. This is what I, I mean, I love this. I've done it before. I've done it with people. I've, but I've been looking for people to do it to me. I need it. And I've met for three sessions. And I'm going to get one more before I leave town this week with, with um, the discernment prayer team. And, and, and here's the principle. Satan traffics in darkness. Yes. And he has full and open access to any area in a Christian's life that is allowed to remain in darkness. And can a Christian have a demon? A Christian can have anything he wants. And so, and my problems that have plagued me my whole life are much more I mean, complex than just like a pornography, a this, a that, a this. You remember I said like he's allowed, anything that's allowed to stay in darkness? Things have to be uncovered. And your discernment prayer team has blown my mind. And they've sat with me and dug and dug and dug and dug and dug and dug and dug. 
and got down and called out and named evil spirits that have been harming me, attempting to enslave me. I've been in a grudge match against for my whole ministry. And but whom the sun sets free, he's free indeed. And so I thank God for this church and, um, and, I, and I thank God for this like probably a little extra too long three minutes. God bless you, brother. <laughs> thank you so much. Amen, brother. I didn't even have to pay for that. And uh, if you come back to second service, David is baptizing someone from the spiritual clinic that's actually in our discovery group next hour. This is our ministry time. If you're not familiar with it, you can pray for one another. You don't even have to have permission to do it. Just go pray for somebody if the Holy Spirit leads. Prayer team will come on up if you want to be prayed for by a member of the prayer team. The baptistry is here. If you want to be baptized now or in the second service, come see me or somebody else. We'll take care of that. Communion is available at the tables. You'll need to go get it and take it with someone in your group. We love you. We thank you for coming. Uh, engage with the Holy Spirit for the next few minutes.